Hello friends, welcome to lesson number five, Excuses to Avoid Mission. I'm Pastor James Rafferty and I am uh, flanked by your Sabbath School panel family. I'm hosting this program and to my immediate left is our professor, Daniel Perrin. Daniel, good to have you here today. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. On Monday's lesson, I've got our excuses of false views. Okay, and then to your left, we have Jason Bradley. Jason, good to have you here today. I'm excited to be here, and I just love the story of Jonah, and he got the excuse, inconvenience. Okay, mm. and to your immediate left, Pastor John Loma King. And I'm including a continuation on Jonah call, uncomfortable confrontations mm. on Wednesday. Okay, and then to your immediate left, at the very end of the table, we have Shelley Quinn. With one of my favorite messages, here am I, send me. Love it, praise God. So we're gonna be looking at a lot of the focus on Jonah in this uh, week's study, but we're also gonna be moving out from that to Isaiah and touching a little bit of the history of God's people in relation to excuses to avoid mission. Before we begin, we wanna ask the Lord to be with us in prayer. And I'm gonna ask uh, Daniel if you'd like to pray for us. Yeah. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that uh, each week there is something new to reveal to us through your word and is through your Holy Spirit. So as we spend this hour listening, studying, thinking, we submit ourselves to your guidance, direct us through your Holy Spirit, and then push us onward to put into practice all that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So a lot of our verses this week are taken from the story of Jonah, but the actual memory text for this week is belongs to Shelley Quinn and it's taken from Isaiah chapter six and verse eight. And it says, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. So we begin Sabbath afternoon's lesson just with this overview of the situation that Jonah is in. You know, not everyone called to mission, uh, as the uh, quarterly says, was as compliant as Abraham. Jonah is an example of one who was reluctant to do what God was calling him to do. God calls Jonah to cry out against Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and this city is located in modern-day Iraq, about 560 miles from Jerusalem, a good month's journey. And Jonah not only refused to go, but he ran in the opposite direction. Now, when you think about Jonah, you might think, well, Jonah, man, he was so unfaithful in comparison to Abraham. But they both had their weaknesses. You know, Abraham lied about his wife being his sister a couple of times. Uh, Jonah was a little bit more transparent with God. I don't wanna go to Nineveh, and I'm not gonna go to Nineveh. And you know, you meet those kinds of people. You meet people in ministry and even in religion that are a little bit more careful about how they nuance their experience. And then you meet others that are just blatant and open and what you see is what you get. So it's not that Jonah is worse than Abraham or Abraham is worse than Jonah. Both of them are human beings. We're all human beings and we all have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. One of the things that I really like about the story of Jonah in comparison to Abraham is he was called to a wicked city. Now Abraham didn't have to go down to Sodom. He didn't have to speak out against Sodom, so to speak, but, but Jonah did. I mean, Jonah was called to go into this city that was a present day, well, I don't know what we'd compare it to. Maybe Chicago's worst areas or LA or New York, and Jonah was just being honest with his feelings. He was struggling with the idea of putting himself in danger. He was struggling with the idea, and so he fled from the Lord. Now, when you read about the city of Assyria and the Assyrians, and you can read about them in Nahum chapter one, uh, and Nahum chapter three, one through four, and then in 2 Kings chapter 17, five and six, and 2 Kings chapter 19, 32 to 37, you realize these were wicked people, and they were powerful people. And they came against Israel with a lot of power and a lot of strength. They were intimidating people. And you can see why Noah, uh, Jonah was a little bit nervous about this. So when I think about the uh, confrontation that Jonah was going in with his feelings, with his emotions, with his call to go down to Nineveh and his fear of going down to Nineveh, I can really relate to that. In fact, there's a lot of things about Jonah that are pretty positive. You know, as he flees from 
God's presence, which is an impossibility, right? Mm -hmm. As he thinks he's fleeing from God's presence, he finds himself in a situation where he has put other people in danger. And as he awakens to the situation, his remedy is self-sacrifice. Throw me overboard. Mm -hmm. So God must have seen something in Jonah that was worthwhile. God must have seen something in Jonah that he said, you know, I could use this guy if he'll just listen to me. I could use this guy if he would just follow my directions and trust me. And I'm gonna show him how I can take care of him. And of course, he was swallowed by that fish. And after three days and three nights, inclusive reckoning in the belly of a fish, Jonah cries out to the Lord. I cry by reason of my affliction unto the Lord and he heard me. And you can only imagine, and I just love this picture of God, you can only imagine how insecure Jonah might have felt or any of us might have felt if we have disregarded God, paid the consequences, and then find ourselves in a situation where we want to cry out to God and wonder if he's going to hear us. And so Jonah says, he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and he heard my voice. And then he recognizes, he acknowledges that salvation belongs to the Lord. So whoever you are, wherever you are, when you cry out to the Lord from the bottom of your heart, no matter how far you've turned from him, he will hear you. And when you acknowledge that salvation is of the Lord, he will deliver you. But that doesn't mean that you've just gotten out of your mission. <laughs> the mission is still on, even though it may seem like mission impossible. And I love this because when you look at the, the story of Jonah, well, the quarterly does a really good job going over the stories. We, we read it here in the quarterly. One of the reasons Jonah may have been unwilling to go to Nineveh was fear. The Assyrians were a formidable foe. Nineveh served as the great capital of the king. And among the cities of the ancient world in the days of uh, divided Israel, one of the greatest was Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. In the times of its temporal prosperity, Nineveh was a great center of crime and wickedness. Inspiration has characterized it as full of lies and robbery. In figurative language, the prophet Nahum compared the Ninevites to a cruel, ravenous lion upon whom he inquired, inquired hath not the wickedness passed, their wickedness passed continually? Nahum chapter three, verse one, and we're reading from Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, page 265. So there's gotta be times in your life when you feel a little bit overwhelmed and even perhaps with the things that God is calling you to do. Now, it might just be the idea of going door to door and handing out tracts or doing uh, literature evangelism. That's how I was brought into, eventually brought into the Adventist church. Someone went to my door and left some kind of uh, Bible uh, uh, study on the door, a door knocker, because I wasn't there. And my sister grabbed that door knocker and ended up studying with Adventists. And I started studying with Adventists to get my sister out of the Adventist church. Long story short, someone was out there going door to door in Spokane, Washington on the South Hill. And they, were not, they knocked on my door, the door of this guy that was you know, partying and didn't care anything about God and left that door knocker. And that's what eventually ended up bringing me into God's church. So you never know when and where God can call you to reach somebody who actually Actually can be receptive to the truth. And I got the call some years ago, it was 1997, to go on a trip to my Nineveh, and that country was Pakistan. Now, Pakistan was at that time a country of 140 million people, and about 2% of them were Christians. In that country, it was an Islamic Republic. In that country, it was illegal for a Muslim to become a Christian. If a Muslim was to become a Christian, they would pay for that by their life. I'll give you an example. When I uh, prepared to travel to Pakistan and uh, heard about, did some research on some of the things that were happening there, I heard the story of a young girl, a Christian girl who had witnessed to a friend at school, a Muslim, and this Muslim girl had become a Christian and her parents killed her. That was the law in Pakistan. The law was if a Muslim becomes a Christian, they die. And then the parents took the Christian girl to court, uh, calling her to be responsible for the death of their daughter that they had to kill because of the law, right? So I'm thinking in my mind, ah, do I want to go to Pakistan? No, I don't want to go to Pakistan. So when the call came in, it was a retired conference president that lived in California and wanted me to go over there and do some evangelism in, in Peshawar, which was right on the border of Afghanistan. And there were about 300,000 Afghanistan refugees there at the time. When the call came in, I said, uh, nah, I don't really want to go. I'm, I'm being honest with you. And I was being honest with him. I was having my Jonah experience. I was just being honest. I said, no, I don't really want to go. But I said, I'm willing to pray about it. I'm willing to pray about it. So I prayed about it. 
And he called me back uh, almost immediately the next day. And he said, you know, how did God lead you in the prayers? And I said, well, God impressed me that I need to go to Pakistan. Mm. So I'm going to go. And I was so scared to go. In fact, I didn't even tell my mother I was going. She lived in England at the time. And I told, I told myself, there's no way I can tell her I'm going to Pakistan because she will freak out. So I went to Pakistan in fear and trepidation. I was in Peshawar. I had an armed guard at my door every night with a shotgun and was doing these meetings. And I, I met a pastor there who was from the Pentecostal church. He became my translator. He was a great guy, um, Ezekiel Zarosh, and like a Billy Graham in Pakistan, well-known songwriter, traveled to the United States every year. And he was the head of about 120 Pentecostal churches. Hmm. And so he came to a series of meetings I was doing in the afternoon for the pastors. In the evening, we were doing an evangelistic series. But in the afternoon, we had a series for the pastors on the book of Revelation. And as he was there, he uh, invited me to come to Lahore, where he was centered, and do some meetings for his pastors there. And so I went back in 98 and 99. But the point I want to make here is this. I was afraid to go to Pakistan, and then I found out about the story of Ezekiel. Ezekiel moved into a community in Lahore where everyone in his neighborhood were Muslims. In that community, he preached and taught and shared and witnessed until everyone in that community had become Christians. The whole community became Christians. And when I heard about that story, I thought, that's incredible because first of all, he himself was putting his life in danger, right? In even witnessing in a, in a Muslim community. And then all of those Muslims that became Christians were also putting their life in danger because the law says, if you are a Muslim and become a Christian, you die. Now, if you're already a Christian, you're okay. But if you, you are a Muslim and you become a Christian, you die. So I, 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 I heard the story of Ezekiel. And he didn't tell it to me, someone else told it to me. And it was powerful, it was beautiful. I thought, that gave me courage. I thought, why am I unwilling to come over here to Pakistan when God has had his hand over this pastor, this Pentecostal pastor, who has stepped into this neighborhood and become a witness for God and all these people obviously receptive to the gospel, wanting to, to learn about Jesus, wanting to receive the Bible, all these people there receptive to God's will. and so. In, in the end, I went back there in 1998, I went back there in 1999, was able to share with many pastors, with many of the people there. In fact, Pastor Steve Wahlberg followed up after I went there, he went there, and we were planning another trip in 2001 until the 9-11 situation took place. And you could see in this experience that God was calling me into that Jonah experience. And perhaps God is calling you, I should say, out of the Jonah experience, into and out of it, so that you won't run from God but that you won't make excuses to avoid mission, but you will see His hand, maybe not on yourself, but on others and recognize that God is working, God is moving to reach the people of the world where you can have an influence and you can have an impact and you will say yes to God, here I am, send me. Thank you, Pastor James, excellent lesson. I was talking to somebody in Houston just a few weeks ago who it was the same thing. Somebody came to their door and left something there and uh, totally, totally put them on a different track. And maybe you share that same experience. I'm Daniel Perrin. I have Monday's lesson, which is our excuses of false views. Now, I had finished preparing for this lesson and I can't tell you how, but uh, I had prepared for the wrong day. I won't tell you which one, but one of the days of the people here, I, I just put together all the thoughts for those. I had been operating on the completely wrong framework and maybe you've done the same thing. A lot of good work went into something, but it was all wrong until you realize, and that's what I did, I looked down the paper, oh, I have Monday's lesson. Mm. And that detail changed everything about what I was supposed to do. And uh, we do the same thing with God. One little detail changes everything. We have it wrong. And Jonah certainly did. Uh, Jonah had bought into a wrong worldview, just a little piece of it about God. Now, the belief systems of nations surrounding Israel went something like this. The God of Israel has jurisdiction over Israel, kind of like some of our law enforcement. They have jurisdiction over here, but not necessarily over there. And the God of the Assyrians, he's active over here. So if you go over here, then the God of Assyria can't touch you. 
Mm. All right, and, and if you go out into, the, into the, the waters, that's the area of demons, and it's scary and frightening. And the, the nature of the storms there certainly made that something that would be believable. And so Jonah reasoned something like this. God called me over here. Hmm. If I go over there, Mm. Well, then, then I'll be away from that and I can, I can kind of be immune from what God expects from me. Uh, and worse yet, he thought this, I could outrun God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, and uh, people, try, people try to outrun or outsmart law enforcement all the time and sometimes they get away with it because our human law enforcement is only human. But think about Jonah, he's an Israelite. And they had a lot of, of spiritual wisdom and knowledge avail to them, available to them. He had Psalm 139 written by David, verse nine, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, could it get any plainer, Jonah, we might say? Even there your hand shall lead me. He was a servant of God, living in the promised land given by the promise keeping God. He knew the scriptures. He knew the sacrifices. He kept the Sabbath. He went to Jerusalem three times a year. He returned the tithe that supported the priesthood. He was a prophet and he knew the voice of God and recognized it. And so we may think, how silly of Jonah, how on earth could he possibly have bought into this idea that he could get away from God? But uh, um, we do it all the time. We do the very same thing with even more knowledge than Jonah had. Any time, for example, that we do not confess our sins, we're just hiding what we have done. We, we move on, counting on a little bit of time to ease the stinging feelings of guilt. And, and if I just can get myself a few weeks away from this, then that experience will die down. Mm. We're gonna outrun God there. A anytime we might be mortified if another human might have seen what we just did. Oh, I hope nobody saw me do that or say that. But God has seen it. And, and, and we, we uh, realize, we, we show that we limit God just like Jonah did. Anytime uh, we know the, the direction that God does want us to take, and yet we drown it with busyness. Jonah bought a ticket for Tarshish, but we spend all sorts of parts of our life buying tickets for, for things to drown out the prompting impressions and voices of the Holy Spirit as if God will be silenced how easy it is. It would happen for Jonah, it happens for us, for these kernels of falsehood to somehow get planted in our belief system and they get planted there by YouTube or some other website or maybe a family member or simply uh, the traditions of culture and we see the cars people are driving and the way they shop and the music they listen to and the education system that we've gone through and somehow it is, has either been inherited or rubbed off on us mm. this false view of God. And maybe it's just a little piece that changes everything. And this is why Psalm 139, that same Psalm, David begs in the last line, verse, uh, in the nearly the last line, verse 24, see if there's any wicked way in me mm -hmm. and lead me in the way everlasting because I'm not immune to absorbing from the culture some view of God that changes everything. Jeremiah 17, nine says, the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. So I may, not, I may not know yet all the truth, but I, I certainly want all that I have to be truth about God or anything, because if I don't, if I have a false, false view of God, it's gonna cripple my willingness and my ability to respond to the great commission. Remember, Jonah is running away from evangelism. He's running away from talking about God. So ask God to help you here in the next few minutes to see if any of these false views, to what degree they might apply to you. And the first one here, a couple of them in the lesson, is that God is concerned only with me and in my, in myself and my needs. And the gauge of this is to look at our prayer life. And what do we pray about? Is it all about our struggles and temptations, our issues and our kids and the obstacles we face and our property and uh, our blessings? Well, if that's all we're praying for, then we're certainly bringing our life to God, but the circle that, that encompasses our life is a little small. Mm. 
And, and God wants that circle to be enlarged and broadened, to move out beyond that. Sometimes we do this by moving away from the cities, which we should do, but for the purpose of continuing to minister to those in cities. And so we put ourselves in a position where we say, God, I'm, I'm here just to have myself enriched and myself worked on my character. And God does want to work on our characters, but not at the exclusion of others. I think about John Knox's famous prayer, give me Scotland or I die. Mm. And then that prayer of Jabez in 1 Chronicles 4, there's, there's books and sermons. I think of a Charles Spurgeon sermon on this very prayer where he says, enlarge my territory. 1 Chronicles 4, verse 10, that is. In other words, widen my borders, and that's the borders of my witness and influence. And so if our prayers are only about ourselves, we can begin by saying, Lord, I'm going to look at my neighbors. I'm going to look to my community and maybe even to those people who've not yet heard about you. Think about some of these. 64,000 Quechua people in Argentina, still no Christian influence working actively among them in a human manner. 1,445,000 Dong people in China, no Christian witness working actively in a human manner. 200,000 Kima people in Sudan, 1,500 Nyakur people in Thailand, and the list can go on and on. We say, Lord, I'm going to pray for these people I've not yet met. Mm. Misunderstanding number two is that missionary service or evangelism happens because I'm the one who do it. I'm the one who does it. So we start to maybe get stressed out if the responsibilities are too big and we can't do it on our own power, or we get disappointed and discouraged if the response is so small. And, and it doesn't satisfy us, we begin to see a ministry as ours and our reputation is on the line. Maybe we might say things like this, I can do this. And we lose sight of God and we lose sight of the Holy Spirit and stop praying for his filling and his leading. On the flip side, we could say, I can't do this. I don't know enough theology. I'm too young. I'm too old. My living situation isn't ideal. Um, we could say, God, God certainly could never use me for that. Mm. I, I can't go door to door. I can't preach a sermon. I couldn't talk in front of people. I can't share my faith. Really? You think God is so limited as to not be able to use you for something that is difficult? That's what Jonah had bought into right here. God's mm. power is limited. We might say, well, it's a good thing I was there or else that would have fallen apart. Mm -hmm. right? and, and maybe it wouldn't have gone so well if, if you weren't there, but we, we put ourselves up in front of God mm -hmm. in that way. Sometimes this misunderstanding crops up that uh, I'll have another chance tomorrow. Hmm. You don't know about that. If God is placing something before you today, do it today. Amen. Hand out that literature, say that prayer, encourage that person. Mm -hmm. Or this one, ministry is just a part of the Christian life. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, you do not have a ministry. You are a ministry. Mm -hmm. Our whole life, God takes the whole part of us. And so we say, Lord, I don't want to limit you to being over there when you are all around me. You prompt me to go wherever you may lead. Amen, amen. You don't have a ministry, you are a ministry. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends, and welcome back to our continuing study in this week's lesson, which is entitled Excuses to Avoid Mission. We're handing it over to Jason Bradley. All right. Hi, I'm Jason Bradley. I have Tuesday's lesson, and we're going to be looking at the excuse of inconvenience. You know, it amazes me how as human beings, we will choose to do something inconvenient to avoid something inconvenient mm. only to be further inconvenienced. <laughs> so, you know, it blows my mind, but there was nothing convenient about going to Nineveh. Nineveh's crime rate was through the roof. They were known as the city of blood. 
mud and it was a place that you did not want to be. But when God calls us to take action, we need to what? Take action. It's never convenient to go against God. And in Jonah chapter two, we see a great cry of desperation from Jonah. He just went through a very traumatic chain of events and he finds himself in distress in the belly of decision. He was stuck in this great big fish and I can't help but wonder what it smelled like in there. It must have been horrible. Was he the only meal of the day? I don't know. But what I do know is that when we run from the Lord, things get worse until we surrender. It almost seems antithetical, uh, but with surrender comes deliverance. In this same chapter, we see Jonah's acknowledgement of God's sovereignty. So let's look at it. Jonah chapter two, verses one through seven. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Now there's something that is worth grabbing onto here, and that is when Jonah cried out to the Lord in his moment of despair, in his darkest trial, in his lowest moment, God heard him and answered him. Mm -hmm. And so when you are in the valley of decision, when you are experiencing uncertainty, and in need of deliverance, you can cry out to the Lord and he will hear you. Now let's pick up in Jonah chapter two, verse three, and see how Jonah acknowledged God's sovereignty. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me up, brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. In verses seven through nine, we see Jonah taking ownership by acknowledging his rebellion and disobedience. We also see his determination to turn back toward God and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Verse seven, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. When we surrender our will to God and we allow his will to be carried out in us, great things happen. Let's check out verse 10. Mm -hmm. So the Lord spoke mm -hmm. to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Mm -hmm. Now, typically you wouldn't be excited to be a part of vomit, but in this case, I think <laughs> Jonah was ready to get out of there. <laughs> now <laughs> we're getting ready to enter into a portion of Jonah's story that is really exciting. And I like to look at this as the restoration portion. God restored Jonah to his original position and gave him work to do. And you know, as I journeyed through this chapter of Jonah's life, I couldn't help but think about Peter. And when Jesus restored Peter, Peter denied Jesus three times, yet God restored him and still gave him work to do. Jesus did that for him. You know the story, John chapter 21, the breakfast by the sea. Let's begin in verse three. Mm. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. I love how the disciples just invited themselves on uh, Peter's fishing trip here. Mm. They went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Interestingly enough, the disciples couldn't catch fish without Jesus and Jonah got caught by a fish and couldn't be released without the Lord. It goes to show God's sovereignty. Now let's jump back to Jonah for a minute. Jonah 
chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Jonah was getting his second chance opportunity, and he took it. Mm -hmm. But I want you to now go back to Matthew. We're going to be jumping back and forth, so <laughs> stay, right. stay with me now. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now we're going we're gonna to talk about Jonah again. Where did the Lord tell Jonah to cast his net? In Nineveh. What did Jonah do? Let's look at verses 3 and 4. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What happened when Jonah cast his net where the Lord told him to? Mm. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 5, beginning in verse 5, and we'll, we'll find the answers there. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed the fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Mm. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and set in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Mm -hmm. Verse 10, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. Mm, God gave Jonah a message that would counteract the counterfeit. God gave Jonah a message that would call the Ninevites to repent, fear God, and give him glory. Mm. God gave Jonah the three angels' messages of his day. Mm. And sometimes as Christians, we embrace Jonah's uh, guardian of the gospel, guardian of salvation mentality, and that's not what God desires. The gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for the person that is tatted from head to toe. The gospel is for the person that's doing life in prison. Mm -hmm. The gospel is for the lesbian, the homosexual, or the trans person, because the good news is Jesus doesn't leave us the way that he finds us. That's right. Yeah. He cleans us up and transforms us. He restores us into his own image. God has given us submission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Remember, there is no success without sacrifice and no growth without growing pains. God provides the success when we do what he asks us to do. And we are responsible for our failures when we don't. The question that I leave you with today is, will you accept the mission that God has given you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jay. Wonderful. And imagine being regurgitated for the purpose of ministry. <laughs> wow. However you get there is always on God's terms. I want to begin Wednesday, which is our excuses, uncomfortable confrontations. And I want to begin with a question. Does God's mercy anger you? That seems like a strange question, but it angered Jonah. God's mercy, think about it. Does God's mercy anger you? Mm. Do you have a family member that you wish God would deal with? Do you have a coworker that you are praying for God to do something to? What about your spouse? What about your children? What about your neighbor? Are you praying for God to change their heart or for God to just do something to them? 
does God's mercy anger you? Mm. That's not a strange question because it angered Jonah, a man on God's mission because our quarterly study is mm -hmm. God's mission, my mission. Mm -hmm. God's mission wasn't Jonah's mission. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, God's mission was anything but Jonah's mission. He tried his best to avoid doing what God had chosen him to do. And God's purpose was far greater than Jonah's reluctance and determination to outrun it. So we start in Jonah chapter four, and thank you, Jay, for that wonderful, wonderful outlay and all of you to this point laid some wonderful foundation. A book only four chapters, yet its message continues to resonate centuries and, and millennia later. Mm. Jonah chapter four, beginning with verse one, look at this. <laughs> God relented of the judgment he was going to pour out on Nineveh, and it begins with these words, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Mm -hmm. Lord, I went to that city to watch it go up in flames, mm -hmm. and you had the nerve to forgive those people. I'm just so upset with you. I spent three days and three nights in a hotel that I didn't want to be in, mm -hmm. And here I am smelling like somebody just threw me out. I did what you asked me to do, but you didn't do what I expected you to do. Does God's mercy anger you? Mm. Look at verse two of chapter four. So he prayed to the Lord. And this is a terrible prayer. Ah, oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. In other words, this is the reason I didn't go to Nineveh because I knew that you're too good. I knew that if I preached this sermon, New York would still be there, mm -hmm. or Chicago or Los Angeles or Detroit or Miami. And I didn't want that city to continue. I didn't want my neighbor to still be next door. That's why I didn't tell him about evangelism. I just wanted you to deal with them. That's why I went to Tarshish. But here I am in Nineveh, and you didn't disappoint me. I'm just disappointed with you. I knew this is who you are. I just did not want you to be who you wanted to be. I wanted you to be who I wanted you to be. Mm. What a man. You see, the prayer about God is beautiful, and God is always long-suffering and abundant. He relents from doing harm when we repent. Look at verses 10 to 11. Jonah was in a pickle and the Lord decided, I need to teach this man a lesson. So after Jonah was sitting, drying off from his excursion in the belly of a fish, mm -hmm. I don't know how long it took, but I can, I can guarantee you some of the residual smell was still there. <laughs> so God prepared a plan for him as he watched Nineveh almost in a disgusting feeling. Look at that city. All those people are now going to church. That's not what I expected. But the Lord said in verse 10 of Jonah 4, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And verse 11, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and much livestock, they don't even know which way to go, but I pardon them. See, I create, so the Lord put this plant to give Jonah shade. And when the plant withered, Jonah was more angry that the plant withered than that God extended mercy mm. to the people of Nineveh. Jonah said, what happened to my plant? God said, the issue is what happened to the city? Jonah was more concerned about a plant. Now, let me just throw this out there to you because some of us would call a fire department to rescue our cat, but wouldn't lift a finger to help our neighbor. Mm. Wow. Some of us would do anything to get that dog out of a sewer, but we would walk past a person on the street who's saying, I need help. Mm. Does God's mercy anger you? You know, the writer of the lesson pointed out some things that I put in three bullets. Jonah was upset the Lord did not destroy Nineveh. He did not want the Lord to show mercy on that city that repented. Jonah wanted to see God's vengeance and not God's mercy. Mm -hmm. And the writers of the lesson pointed out, and I read this, Jonah, Jonah struggled with hatred. Wow, 
That's something that has been, become replete in America over the last five, six, ten years. I think it's coming more to the surface. But the human heart will be exposed at certain points in time in history. Jonah struggled with hatred for that city. And the writers of the lesson wrote, Jonah had such a deep hatred for the people that God sent him to that he felt it was better that he die than to lose face when the failure of his doomsday preaching against Nineveh was revealed. Man, I was preaching destruction and it didn't happen. They continued to write, Jonah wanted Nineveh to be the next Sodom and Gomorrah. He was hoping for God's judgment on these hated people, hated particularly by him. When it didn't happen, his worldview was being shaken to the core and Jonah would rather die than allow his world to be turned upside down. Mm. You see, the issue was Jonah's worldview of God. He saw God as subject to his desires rather than him subject to God's mission. God, you need to do what I want you to do. No, the Lord said, no, you need to do what I want you to do. What a way to arrive at an evangelistic series. Mm -hmm. You see, friends, God does not harmonize with ordinary logic. He does not think as we think. He does not make his decisions based on what I call ocular confirmations. What we see, he makes his decisions based on his sovereign will. And so here are some of the things that God does. Isaiah 55, verse 9. Jonah should have looked back at this before he went to Nineveh. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Jonah and those of you that may be watching feeling like Jonah, mm. God's ways are not our ways. Don't pray for your will to be done. Say, Lord, you know what I want, but I'm willing to allow your will to be the sovereign decision maker in this situation. The other thing is God's mercy is higher than our mercy. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Isn't it good to know that God's mercy is higher than our mercy? Mm -hmm. There are many times that God could have dealt with us according to the way that other people felt, mm -hmm. but God extended mercy instead. Praise him for that. Psalm 103, verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Amen. How beautiful. When you come clean with God, God cleans you up. When you come clean with God, God cleans you up. Jonah had a distorted view of God. The three things that I thought about Jonah, he said, it is impossible to preach and have a distorted view of God. But let me say something. It is possible. Jonah did it. Could you be a preacher preaching that has a distorted view of God? Could you be that kind of preacher? Could you have a distorted view? It is possible to preach repentance and desire destruction instead. Are you that kind of preacher? It is possible to carry out God's purposes reluctantly. Are you that kind of preacher? Plan number one, God's plans are accomplished not because of us, but in spite of us. Yeah. Mm. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, after all these years of ministry, I'm so glad that God does not think the way that I do because God will be in trouble and I would be in more trouble. God is not looking for ability. God is looking for availability. First mm -hmm. Corinthians 1 verse 26 to 29. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Mm -hmm. Jonah had a problem in my third point. Jonah thought that God needed his strength. No, God needed his availability. And finally, God's purposes are not hindered by adversity. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to God's purpose. Don't be a Jonah preacher. Be a man on God's mission. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, each and every one. What a beautiful study to stir our hearts and to wake us up to where we recognize we can't be offering the Lord excuses. What he's looking for are willing volunteers who will say, here am I, send me. Let's begin. I'm Shelley Quinn.
That's the title of this lesson on Thursday. Here am I, send me. If you have your Bibles, you might want to open to Isaiah chapter 6. I love this passage. You know, the Lord was teaching me in 1999. He taught me to journal my prayers and to pray His Word back to Him. And I actually remember typing out Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, just including it in my prayer. And something amazing happened. Let's read Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, this would be Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one of these seraphim cried to another and said, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door, this would be in the sanctuary, were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I, Isaiah, said, Woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Hmm. Don't think this is a particular problem to Isaiah. Any of us getting into the presence, pressing into the presence of the Lord, would recognize we are people of unclean lips. And then he says, Woe is me. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it. And he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is mm -hmm. taken away. Your sin is purged. And here it is, Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. You know, I prayed that in December. It was right around the 1st of December, 1999. And as the Lord was working with me through my prayer time each morning, I began to recognize his call to full-time ministry. Then I received it in my heart, and finally I responded to it. Now, we don't have time to go through those three stages, but I want to encourage you. I did a, th God gave me a three-part series that I did on 3ABN Worship Hour. It is about recognizing his call receiving his call and responding to his call. And the interesting thing is this lines up with three steps that he taught me to simplify surrender. Hmm. The first is to know God. The second is to stop resisting his love and submit to his authority. And then the third is to yield to the Holy Spirit's leading. Mm. So, watch how these line up. You have to know God to recognize His call. You have to stop resisting His love and submit to His authority to receive His call. And then you have to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit to respond to His call. You know what? God is crying out today, listen, listen for the still small voice. He is saying, who shall I send? Who will go for us? The Sabbath school quarterly says, the call is there. God is looking for willing volunteers. We are to answer to that call by submitting to his leadership, listening to his voice, and then choosing to obey what he hears, what he tells us. I love Matthew 9, 36 through 38. Jesus 
is amongst the multitudes. And when he sees the multitudes, Matthew 9, 36, he's moved with compassion for them because they were weary and they are scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Mm. Oh, open your eyes. Look around. Does that not describe the multitudes mm. today? Mm -hmm. That was the multitudes in Nineveh. Mm -hmm. Those are the multitudes in Las Vegas, Los Angeles, wherever we go. This, the sheep having no shepherd. And it, Jesus said mm. to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, mm -hmm. but the laborers are few. Now listen to this imperative. He gives this as an instruction, as an order. He says, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers to his, into his harvest. See, God's harvest fields are white. They're ready to be reaped. We may not have done the planting. We may not have. It was God who sent the rain. God who brought the increase. But we cannot be like the reluctant Jonah. Hmm. All that God seeks is humble hearts who are willing messengers, humble messengers who will follow his direction. And I just have to say this one more time. It is not our job to save anyone. We can't save anyone. All we can do is share. You know, when people realize that, sometimes people are like, oh, I can't be a missionary because I can't, I, I can't mm -hmm. save anyone. No, that's the Holy Spirit's job. That's God's job. All right. we've got to do is to be a conduit. See, Jesus said, I will make you fisher of men. Guess what? We're not the ones who are supposed to clean up the fish. God does that. Hmm. Only he can convict and convince the heart. So what our quarterly says is the story of Jonah also reveals God's love for people who live where his love is not felt. I can't imagine not knowing God. They, they, they live where his love is not felt, his voice is not heard. And just as God had pity on Nineveh, he has pity on the millions populating the cities today where buildings replace trees and flowers. That's right. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Constant noise makes it difficult to be still and listen of Nineveh, God said in Jonah 4, 11, that these people did not know their right hand from their left. They were lost. Yeah. So God needs messengers who are willing to take his message of hope to those who are overwhelmed. And we know that that's most of the people. Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, who who will we send for mm -hmm. us? And he said, here am I, send me. I want to take a minute. To me, the most important part of this entire quarterly is Thursday's lesson. Each lesson has a challenge and a challenge up. If you're not getting into the challenge and, and responding to the challenge or the challenge up, all you're doing is gaining more information. Don't let this be theoretical teaching to you. I am going, I am taking these challenges seriously as well. And our challenge for this Thursday is this, on a blank sheet of paper in your prayer journal, write the name of 10 people who are not believers, call them your disciples, list them by name if possible, keep this list close by, pray for these people daily all throughout this quarter. Pray you can develop a relationship with them. Pray that God will open a door that uh, to an area of need that you can meet and then you can then share the gospel. Challenge up. Choose a city near you or in another part of the world and begin to ask God to send an Adventist Christian presence there. There's such 
power in prayer, but this will change your heart. This will get you involved in mission. Amen. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. We just have a couple minutes left and we're going to have some closing thoughts. Daniel? Yes. In, in the last verse of the book of Jonah, God describes the people of Nineveh as those not knowing their right hand from their left hand. Who doesn't know their right and left hand? It's little children. Mm. It's little toddlers. And God says, these are my children. I love them. Go show them, please, how much I love them. They can't see it without you. Amen. Amen. You know, God has given us all a mission answer that mission, answer that calling that God has placed on your life and you will be fulfilled. And people will be one to the kingdom because God wants to spend eternity with them and he wants to spend eternity with you and all of us. Amen. That's right, the question is, should God be more merciful to a plant or to people? Here's the answer, <laughs> Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but it's long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Intercessory prayer is one of the highest callings to ministry there is because it is the ministry of our risen and exalted Savior who intercedes for us daily and he's able to save to the uttermost. Please put the prayer challenges into place and ask God to open and change your heart. Amen. Amen. What a powerful lesson. I really appreciated the, the key thoughts that each one of you had to share. Daniel, I like what you said there when you said you don't have to, you don't have a ministry. You are a ministry. Mm -hmm. And Jason, I like the thought that you shared there where it's, you said God will fill our nets when we cast them where God directs mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And John, I appreciated your emphasis that does God's mercy anger you? We need to ask that question deep in our hearts. And then Shelley, listen, submission, respond. God is looking for humble hearts who are willing to share. Amen. And so I know that each one of us have been blessed this, this week in the lesson that we've focused on, excuses to avoid ministry, excuses to avoid minish, min, minishing, I should say. Next week, we're going to be looking at motivation and preparation for missions. So be sure and join us as we continue to study this Sabbath School quarterly.